Hi again. This is our second brief lecture for chapter 12. And in this lecture, as I said in the, at the end of uh, the first brief lecture, we're going to speak more about organizational change and how that, in fact, can influence the organization and how we can overcome some of the resistance that is likely to occur from organizational change. Well, I think you've heard by now the common mantra throughout uh, organizations in contemporary society that the only thing we know for certain or the only thing in common that most organizations have is the need for the need for change. So change is apparent, change is important, and therefore as managers or people that are, that are attempting to become managers, we need to be able to focus, understand, and uh, effectively lead change. So first of all, a change leader, because that's what you want to be as a manager. Well, a change leader is a change agent who takes leadership initiative for changing the existing pattern of behavior of another person or social system. Basically, you take responsibility for helping an individual or a system, a group, an entity change or adapt the way of doing things, okay? That is what a change leader is all about, taking responsibility for helping someone else or helping an organization to move, to adapt, to change the way that things are being done. There are different types of changes within an organization. We know most, more so about top-down change. And what is this? That's where change initiatives are coming from senior management. This is the traditional or conventional way that change has been inspired or change has been catalyzed in the past. Basically, those people at the very top decided what needed to be changed and how that change was actually going to be effected. And that was then conveyed or communicated to those below them in the organization. Now, we mentioned before, many times before in our other lectures, that this top-down approach, this type of command and control approach, isn't necessarily very popular or even very successful in contemporary business organizations. However, there is still opportunity and there is still possible success that can come from top-down change. If you recall when we spoke in chapter 11 about mechanistic organizations and the fact that some organizations, like military units for example, can embrace and actually succeed with mechanistic type organizations, centralization of authority if you recall that, then in those types of organizations, top-down change where the commanders at the very top determine what needs to be done and how it's going to be done in terms of change and then communicates that it can be effective. It can be effective in those types of organizations. But in order for those to be effective, you must have the support of the middle and lower level workers. In the military, that is, there is a greater likelihood of that type of support because people accept the line of authority, the hierarchy of authority when they're getting to the military. They, re they recognize that their superiors, regardless of their age, regardless of their race, whatever, because they occupy that position of authority, then they will be supported merely because of their authority or their position of authority. And so in those types of organizations, because you have that built-in support of the middle and lower level workers, top-down change is likely to work. But in most organizations, you don't necessarily see top-down change. What you see now or what you should see is this concept of bottom-up change. And what is bottom-up change? Well, as the name implies, going back again to chapter one when we had the upside-down pyramid, instead of change coming directly from the top or only from the top, change in a bottom-up change approach can come from any of all parts of the organization, not just the top. Okay? So in bottom-up change, any part of the organiza organization can initiate and can even lead change. And that is made possible because of things like the employee empowerment, having more employees involved and having more employees participating even in the management process. And this really helps organizations because as you would realize or you should realize, 
the innovation or creativity that comes from organization does not necessarily only reside at the top of the organization. People at the very lowest levels of the organization can have great ideas. For example, excuse me, for example, 3M had a policy in place for many years where it would give its employees a certain amount of time each week to simply think about new and creative ideas. And it would ha harness those ideas for new products and services that the organization wanted to create. It recognized very early on that in order to change, in order to have innovation, the firm had to utilize all its human capital, not just the human capital at the very top. And that's what an organization that's highly innovative. Many organizations are moving towards this, again, bottom of change. But in order for that to be successful, the people in the organization must feel like they're empowered to initiate and to bring about change, and they must also be part of the change process. Returning back, we, we see this concept of transformational change. And transformational change is interesting because, as the name implies, it is a significant movement away from the old way of doing things. Okay, So in transformational change, we're not just talking about, as you'll see, uh, very soon. We're not talking about small or incremental change. We're talking about a drastic or radical way change in the way that we do business. I think, for example, of a company like uh, Samsung. Samsung, when they began, when it, when it began business, uh, sorry, was uh, a low cost leader. Its its products uh, were cheap. They were made uh, as copycats of the existing products of much more innovative firms. And the firm recognized, or it was forced, into changing the way it did business because it lost its low-cost leadership advantage. And so the manager, the CEO of the organization at that time, decided that the firm would move away from being a cost leader, from being someone that simply copied everyone else, to being a leading innovator in its industry. Well, that required a transformational change. That was just not adapting the way we do things. That was a major paradigm shift. And in order to do that, the, the, the CEO had to do some things. Well, one, establish a sense of urgency for change. Okay? People need to realize and recognize that change must occur, but it also must occur now. We don't have a lot of time in which to, to change. Uh, have a coalition. Make sure that you get powerful people, people that are influencers, to be part of your change process to support you. Create and communicate that vision. Ensure that everyone understands what we want to do and they're inspired to do it. Empower others to move forward. As we say, a bottom-up change, it, it works because others feel that they are part of the process. Short-term wins and recognize those who help. That's really important, especially when you're talking about a major transformation where the end result will probably not be realized for a few years. And so what do you do in the, in the meantime? Well, you can't wait till everything's finished, till it's all over before you start celebrating. You must have or you must celebrate your short-term gains, your short-term term wins along the way to help people to continue to stay committed and motivated to the process. You build on success and you align people with system in new ways. Again, you build on what works and what doesn't work, you try to do something else. And you stay with it. You stay committed. If you truly believe in this, you have to stay committed If even if you do not see the results. I think of someone like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that can be described as a transformational change leader. And you see all of these traits or these attributes or these actions being portrayed in his life. He did all these things. He made sure that people recognized the urgency of the need to change. He empowered others. He built on the success and he was committed. He persevered. Even going through prison, he stayed and he was committed. And his dream and his vision lived on even after his death. And so related to this concept of transformational change that we said major comprehensive redirection is there's also this concept of incremental change. And what that is, is it's simply more so of a, a bending or adjusting of existing ways to improve performance. So if you want to think of it this way, uh, incremental change is kind of 
slowly getting uh, giving up something like let's say cigarette smoking okay and incremental increment let's say right now you're smoking about two packs a day well over the next six or seven months you can start going down from maybe two packs to a pack and a half to maybe a pack to maybe a half a pack to maybe four and so by the end of seven months you're down to maybe one cigarette or no cigarettes a day okay, that's incremental change you're bending you're adjusting you're kind of shifting slowly and so by that, by the end, you will get there, hopefully. Whereas transformational change is kind of going cold turkey. You're smoking two packs a day. Tomorrow you wake up, you throw all your cigarettes away. That's major drastic change. Well, what's the benefit of incremental change? Well, the benefit of incremental change is that it's easier to do. And it's also easier to convince others to do. Why? Because it's it's slower. You don't feel such a big shock. It isn't such a big or a drastic alteration so it's a little more comfortable the problem with incremental change however it is does not necessarily promote that sense of urgency and it may not be drastic enough to see any great uh, difference in the result because it's incremental because it's slow there's no urgency necessarily and there may not be enough of a change to realize any difference in results. With transformational change, the benefit, of course, is that we get that sense of urgency, we change, we make this drastic uh, shift, and so we're likely to see results altered, change dramatically, but that isn't necessarily a good thing because we might actually incur more risk by making transformational change. Okay, so by transformational, transformational shift, can actually lead to having a bigger failure in some instances. And the other problem with transformational change, because it's so drastic, because it's so sudden, a lot of times it take, requires a lot more convincing to get people to support that type of change. And now we turn our attention to the, the, the phases of a plan change. And this is Kurt Lewin's model. And there are three elements of this model okay and it's, they're very simple to understand and i'm going to actually try to use the the analogy or the symbolism in the words that lewin uses to help explain these three phases so lewin says the first phase of plan change is unfreezing so think about this like a block of ice the block of ice is frozen it's stable or we'll say it's inert okay the liquid i used to be a chemistry major the liquid has transformed into a much more solid or sturdier a uh, compound in terms of ice in order for us to move that we then has have to transform it to a much more a much more liquid and mobile type of compound. In order to do that, we have to unfreeze the ice, okay? How do you unfreeze ice? Well, you heat it. You heat it, right? You basically, you stimulate it to change its properties. And that's what you're doing in the unfreezing stage of change. It says it's the phase in which a situation is prepared for change and felt needs for change are developed. You start lighting the fire under some people, right? You start lighting the fire under the organization. Now, in some instances, that fire has already been lit because of poor results, because of changes in the environment, because of a new something has happened that has lit that fire. But sometimes it isn't very, very, or the fire has not necessarily been lit or been kindled by something in the environment or by some results. And people within the organization themselves have to start lighting that fire. So how do you do that? Well, the first thing that you do is you have to get people uncomfortable with the way that they are presently doing things. And you may have realized this before, even especially those of you that are parents, but even those of you, those of you that are not, that it's very difficult to get people unfrozen even when their behavior or their actions are leading to poor results. People tend to stick with things or doing things in certain ways, even if they don't see any benefit from doing that. Why? Because even if it's not beneficial, beneficial the old way of doing things, it's safe, it's certain, and it's comfortable. 
And so you have to get people uncomfortable by lighting fires. One, by indicating to them the problems or demonstrating to them the problems that are related to their present way of doing things. But that by itself is not enough. It's not enough to tell people what they are doing is wrong or to indicate to them the problems with their behavior. I sometimes look at the show Intervention where people who are hooked on, on certain drugs are, 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 are faced with the reality of what their drug abuse has caused in terms of their family breakdowns, their loss of jobs, even their physical outlook. They, 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 they're brought to that conclusion through this intervention. And so people, their family members tell them how much they've, been, they've hurt them, you know, how they lost their job. They even have to see themselves, how they look physically, right? And that's kind of unfreezing. I'd say, listen, the old way, that's not working. But it's that isn't enough in order to promote some kind of change. You have to give these people some solutions, some recommendations of how you can get help. Okay, so you can get into this program or you can do this. It's not enough to simply say the old way isn't working. You have to start what? You have to start indicating to others or to people that you want to change some of the new alternative ways of doing things and why those ways are going to be more helpful, more beneficial than the old ways. You can't just say, don't do this. You must give them an option of what they can do. So that's the unfreezing. That's the unfreezing. And so when you unfreeze ice, it now becomes this liquid. It's, it's transferable. It's mobile. And that's where you go through the the changing phase, your changing phase. And so you take that and then you can move that, okay, mold it into whatever you would like the new system to look like you whatever you like the move system because it's much more malleable because it has more fluidity in it and in an organization that's the phase when which something new takes place in the system and change is actually implemented as a leader you must take this initiative now to do things differently to get people to behave differently and to start reinforcing those types of behaviors training molding, guiding, listen to all these terms. As leaders, you have to help people to change because initially people, again, are still somewhat resistant, they're somewhat hesitant, and they're somewhat uninformed about what the change is, why they even need the change, and how the change should actually occur. So as a leaders, leader, you have to be an exemplar and a champion for change. You have to be the person. So let's say, real simple example, as a manager of an organization, you think that your workers need to become more healthy. They knew as a, people, all of us in the office, we just need to live healthier lives. Well, as a leader, you've got to start that in terms of in terms of your exercise regime, your nutritional habits, your eating patterns, the stuff that you order maybe for the office meetings. Those kinds of things have to come from you as a leader because you are the one that others are going to look up to to guide their change process. So that's what you're doing changing. You're molding and you're shaping new behavior. You do the same thing with the water. You can shape it based upon how you mold it and guide it to take on this new shape, this new figure that you would like. And then once you get it to that point where you're good, where you like the new patterns, where the new system has been created, what do you do? Well, you have to guess what? You have to refreeze. You have to refreeze. Because if you don't refreeze, if you don't make the system stable again, what's going to happen? There's going to be continuous fluidity. The system is never going to come to rest, and so you're never going to get the benefits of the change. So you have to, once you've molded it, once you've changed it to the point that you want it to be, you then have to refreeze it. You have to refreeze it. And that's the phase of stabilizing the change and creating the conditions for its long-term continuity. You have to basically stabilize, reinforce. Now that you have people behaving in certain ways, you have to ensure that they continue to behave in those ways through incentives, through motivation, through setting policies and guidelines to reinforce, to create that culture that would then, excuse me, support 
that change. And that's the refreezing. If you don't refreeze, if you don't take the time to establish those principles, those new ways of doing things, then people are, one, likely to revert back to the old way of doing things or essentially move into new directions that you never necessarily cared for them to do. So you have to remember to reestablish or refreeze the change. The last thing we're going to look at is why people resist change. And if you need to remember this slide for any reason, just think about some of the reasons you resist change. Well, it's obvious, right? We're fearful of the unknown. No matter what, how bad our present situation is, we are still more certain of it than we are of what's outside many occasions, okay? So think about someone who has fallen into a hole. You would think the first thing that they would like to do is get out. Of course they would like to get out the hole, but if they stay in that hole for long enough, someone comes from the outside and th throws them a line and says, hey, you want to come out the hole? They first want to know what, what's out there. You know, I'm, I'm, yeah, freedom perhaps, but I don't really know. I know exactly what's in this hole. This hole is dark, it's dirty, it's dingy, but it's my hole. I think about one of my favorite movies, uh, The Shawshank Redemption. And uh, one of the characters in The Shawshank Redemption talks about being institutionalized. He says, prison has that weird impact on you, influence on you. At the beginning, all you want to do is you want to get out, you want to escape. And after a few years, all you want to do is to stay in because you are fearful of the outside. You become fearful of the unknown. That's what happens many times with people. They resist that change because they fear. They fear, what is it going to be like? Is my job going to be safe? What is going to be expected of me? I know how to work here. Now, I, wouldn't, I don't necessarily know what I would need to do in the future. Disrupted habits. Okay, I'm real comfortable doing things the way it is. Now you're going to make me or require me to do things differently. I don't know if I would want to do that. Loss of confidence. Again, I'm very good at what I do now, but what you're asking me to do, I may not be very good at, at least initially, so I might not be as confident in myself. The loss of control. I can't have that certainty. Poor timing, work overload, loss of faith, all of these things where I am concerned about my personal well-being. What will happen to me if or when this change occurs? That's why people many times resist change. Well, how do you deal with that? How do you overcome that resistance? Well, it's clear, okay? That should be evident. If people are concerned about their well-being, if people are concerned about the benefits of this change, then you have to clearly articulate and identify to them how change is actually going to make their lives better. What's in it for them? That's the question that you have to answer. So you can check the benefits. Okay, make sure that those involved see a clear advantage in doing this. This is the way we were doing it, and this, was, this is what our profitability was. If we do it this way, this is what our profit, profitability will be, and this is how you're going to directly benefit from that. So check the benefits. Check the compatibility. You know what? Although this is different to the way that you've been operating before, it really isn't that different. So you try to keep changes similar to existing value and processes, okay? You try to keep, keep, keep something because if people try to change everything too quickly, then it becomes overwhelming. So you try to have some type of constant, some type of area of stability where people can still at least feel comfortable while you change other things, okay? When you try to change everything, that's when people kind of get freaked out. So you try to make sure that the change is relatively similar or the change is relatively compatible with some of the old ways. Now, you don't want too much compatibility because then you won't have any significant transformational change. But you still want to have some or you still want to identify some areas of compatibility to make the change more comfortable. Check for simplicity. People already do not want to change. If you make it too complex, if you make it too difficult, then they definitely won't want to change. So you want to make it as easy as possible. Make it simple, make it understandable, make it easy for them to incorporate into their lives. And then the triability. Allow people to get a trial, a sample of it, before they have to go full on into it. Just try it. See how you feel after a week or so. And that helps them to kind of ease on into the process, to feel like they don't have to 
go head first, just kind of ease on in, and that promotes uh, willingness to change, okay? So those are some of the ways, and we do that all the time in life in different areas. We do that with kids all the time. I do it with my son, you know, especially if I want him to, to try a new food or something like that. Then I'll say, okay, just take just take one bite. Just take one bite and tell me what you think after. If I say, okay, you got, you got to eat this whole new, you know, bowl of spaghetti here you never seen before that doesn't look like anything that you ever ate, eaten before, I don't know if he's going to willingly embrace that. But if I say, you know, you just try one bite. Well, I'll tell you how great this tastes. This tastes, or, you know, given the benefits or compatibility. Spaghetti tastes just like meatloaf or something like that. You know, getting him feeling that compatibility and making it easier. Okay, let me help you. I'll break it up for you. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll bring it to the table. Change, resisting change is easy. Overcoming change many times is hard. But if you do these things, it can be very helpful in life and obviously very helpful in organizations.